In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I've been reading about an American controversy. I've been reading editorials in long-standing, reputable newspapers about a young woman who is doing quite well writing and performing music. In fact, she's doing so well, domestic cities and foreign countries send agents to persuade her to come to their area because her presence significantly increases their economies. Recently, this young woman has developed an interest in professional football. She is sometimes seen in a guest booth smiling. Sometimes a television camera owned and manned by a company over which she has no control pans across the booth and captures her cheering. Last week, it was reported she was on screen 40 seconds out of a three hour and 20 minute game. Apparently, her 40 second image was enough to provoke both outrage and ecstasy. In living rooms, sports bars, social media platforms, talk radio, casual lunch conversations, sides were taken. This young woman is responsible for either ruining, ruining, ruining America's beloved game and putting the National Football League in grave jeopardy of losing fans and finance, or she is responsible for saving father-daughter relationships across the land of the free and the home of the brave. What I've learned in my reading is a lot of people don't care about this particular controversy. A lot of people care a lot. A lot of people really, really adore this young woman. And a lot of people can't stand her. I suspect there are many people who, like me, doubt that this level of anger and angst, adoration and gushiness surrounding her presence in a stadium or on a television screen is not the true story. It's hard for me to believe that a species that can defy gravity and put themselves on the moon, that can tinker around and turn a wristwatch into a functioning computer, that can write the Magna Carta or the Declaration of Independence or the I Have a Dream speech, that can paint Monet's water lilies or compose Mahler's Symphony Number no. 8 in E-flat major, written for a thousand instruments that has the gift of memory, reason, and skill would get so worked up over such a trivial thing. Surely something else is going on. Surely something else is going on. From other reading, conversations, and prayer, I sense the something else is this. My countrymen are weary and anxious. I sense they are worn out by the political divide that shows no signs of resolution. We are blessed we are blessed as a nation that benefits from a variety of ethnic influences 
and struggles to assimilate those influences into a body that holds together easily. From statistics, we know that too many of our citizens live in poverty, and too many of us are clueless as to what a day in their life is like. We see disparity between the haves and the have-nots and can't agree if it's a problem or just an inevitability. We've survived a global pandemic and we look fine, but what's been lost or changed that we don't yet recognize? Too many people we pass on 485 or in the aisles of Harris Teeter are living in dread of a bill they cannot pay. There are classmates in your children's classes who don't feel safe or loved in their homes. We are a day, a week, a month away from a shooting in a it will never here happen here location. We are beleaguered, and too many of us are hopeless. Too many of us are full of fear. I suspect that those who are hopeless are that way because they are convinced that the quality of their life and the lives of their children is unlikely to improve in the future. Those who are fearful are convinced that the quality of their lives and the lives of their children is likely to change for the worse in the future. And beloved, living in hopelessness and fear is not good for us. It does not bring out our best. It does not elevate our thinking or our problem solving and certainly not our compassion. The longer we reside in either of these states, the harder it becomes to move on from them. Today's state of our national psyche is not unique. It has happened before many times in many places. Today's appointed reading from the Old Testament was written for a time such as this. The second book of Isaiah was written from the words of a prophet sent by God to a people in exile. They were given to a people who had been promised a great heritage. They had heard and they believed that they were God's chosen. They assumed they would always be close to his heart. He would watch over them and grant them greatness. As a people, they had known heroic, moral, and ethical times. They had prospered. They had been the envy of other nations. They had suffered setbacks and once a previous captivity. They never expected another. But in nine, excuse me, in 597 BC, their nation was overrun. Many were slaughtered, and many more were bound in chains and dragged 700 miles from Jerusalem into Babylon. For 58 years, God's chosen languished in a land not their own speaking a language not their own, sitting through worship not their own, singing songs, reciting prayers, observing traditions not their own. They lost fortune. They lost security. They lost identity. They lost hope. Then, years and decades into their captivity, a messenger arrived. 
He came with a promise of deliverance, not judgment. He came saying, take heart. Do you not know? Can you not see? The God who created the world and all its peoples also controls its history, their history. Despite present appearances, God is here working out his providence. Hardship and suffering and discourse come upon the earth by evil forces and by man's own making, but they do not prevail to everlasting. They are not the final answer. They come for their time, and then they are overcome by God's might. God's justice and God's purpose ultimately triumph. For reasoning beyond our knowing, God allows the line of chaos and distraction to be let out. But never, never, never allows it to break from his firm hand. He is aware of all present dangers, knows every errant thought, every errant deed, and is not threatened. Before this God, No competing idols, no competing ideologies, no super pacts, no superstars, no mortal conspiracies, no satanic forces will succeed. God and all that God desires will emerge victorious. The prophet told the beleaguered, the hopeless and the fear-filled people pining in Babylon. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint nor grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. A first reaction might be, well, this is a poetic cheer, a platitude, something one offers when grief or the ordeal seems too big to overcome. But it is not that. It is a divine promise from the Almighty. When Isaiah says, wait for the Lord, He uses the Hebrew word kava, which is not a passive verb. It is proactive. It means to bind up, to make stronger the work for today, to do faithfully and diligently what God has called you to do today. And in practicing kava, God gives strength to endure and enough faith to hold on until the time of his deliverance. The exiled Israelites heard and heeded Isaiah. They kavod. Time passed and they were indeed, in fact, delivered. The Babylonian captivity ended. They returned to their homeland to begin again renewed. In our time, beloved, in our time of dis-ease, division, distraction, and distrust, 
in our time of short-temperedness and quick judgment, in all manner of ways masking our hopelessness and fear, what is our kava? What is the work God has called us to do faithfully and diligently today and tomorrow and the day after as we await his deliverance into something better? Circling back to the beginning, some of you may expect me to say, shake it off, shake it off, shake it off. But no, our kava is more deliberate than that. For this time, for this trial, our waiting for the Lord is to say our prayers and to be kind. Daily, faithfully, when tested, when weary, when scared, when irritated, say our prayers, be kind. Say our prayers, be kind. Say our prayers, be kind. That, beloved, we can do. That, dear hearts, we have control over. In that, God will deliver us from our distress. In that way of waiting, we too will be renewed in strength and shall rise with wings like eagles. May it be so.